participants uh, today we are going to record for Chinua Achebe's famous article on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness it's called An Image of Africa Racism in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness first let's look at a summary of this particular chapter what exactly is it about so in this article Achebe discusses the racism that the western countries hold particularly in its views of Africa so not so much about India or China or Middle East but about Africa he builds his argument around Joseph Conrad's famous novel, Heart of Darkness, the story of a narrator's journey through the Congo to find one Mr. Kurtz. He states that the image is particularly in Conrad's obsession with blackness and the darkness of not just the native skin color, but the land itself shows Africa as an antithesis, as the opposite of England and the rest of the civilized world. Conrad is obsessed with the primitive nature of Africa and its people in an attempt to show that Europe was able to conquer that darkness, but that there is danger in interacting with people and places who have not yet conquered that savagery because the savagery could engulf the civilized and lead them back to primitivism. Conrad is unkind to the native peoples in his novel. He is sympathetic but not empathetic, showing them always in a frenzy or dying or otherwise running around. There are no happy black people in this novel. They are not given language but grunts and sounds and physical actions. The only two times when they are given language are when they are cannibals asking for people to eat or the slave man telling the narrator that Mr. Kutz is dead. The Africans don't speak. Those examples, actually states, are purposeful in that they are made to show how horrific these people are and how awful the state they are in as black people. So it's a very most, you know, deplorable situation being a black person according to Conrad's novel. Given these images, it is clear that Conrad is racist for Achebe and it is surprising to Achebe that in all the years of scholarship, no one seems to even want to admit that or deal with it. That's a point. All these years, decades, nobody even mentioned the fact that Conrad was racist. Great thinkers and philosophers like Bertrand Russell were huge fans of Joseph Conrad. Russell even named his own child son after Joseph Conrad. Okay. So you could imagine the kind of popularity Mr. Joseph Conrad had among the European intelligentsia. But till Achebe came along, nobody had even pointed this out. It is a blind spot in Western world because people in the West have so long used Africa as a foil of themselves, insisting that Africa is as backward as Europe is enlightened. It's like Mohanlal and Mamuti. So uh, you have Mamuti fans and uh, Lalitan fans, they are fighting. So without the one, the other will not be so successful. Not exactly like that, I'm just joking. The point is that Africa is constructed as the opposite of Europe. So when people say that they are not aware that Africa has art or history, it is part of that tradition of racism and colonialism. In order for any good or real communication between Africa and Europe and North America to happen, the West must first relinquish its long-held beliefs about the primitiveness of the African continent and the African people. So, in order for a conversation to be possible, we have to be equals. Discussion of the work. This piece discusses racism in a way that I think is very telling. It shows that what has happened is that the Western countries have fallen prey to a single story about Africa. A single story is powerful in that it can give people motivations. But Africa has multiple stories. The story Conrad is telling might be correct. But there are other beautiful stories about Africa which he is not telling you. Okay. Like for instance, other African writers who are active today like Chimamam and Dangozi Adichie discussed a very similar thing in the TED talk that she gave called The Danger of the Single Story where she states that her teachers once told her that her novel was not authentically African because people were not poor, starving or otherwise destitute or unenlightened. Her characters looked too much like the average Western person. So many people did not like that. Are you whitewashing Africa? That was the question. The image of Africa and its people as backwards and primitive exists in many forms today, including that we group the whole African continent together as a group and remain largely ignorant to the fact that Africa is composed of many countries, just like the Americas, Europe and Asia. So in Europe, of course, England is different from its neighbor, France or Ireland. Similarly, Africa is not just one space, it's a continent, it's an entire continent as large as Asia. So different African countries are entirely different from each other like chalk and cheese. Just like the Americans, Europe and Asia, 
the issues set forth by Achebe in his essay are still very prominent. So, the power dynamics inherent in the way we discuss Africa and its people says much about the Western world's continued need for dominance. And this dominance we have to resist using tools and name according to Chinua Achebe. So, it's a way for Europeans to prove that they are still more enlightened than the people who live on and descend from ancestors on the African continent. So, let's read the essay proper. An image of Africa, racism in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. In the fall of 1974, I was walking one day from the English department. So, this is an anecdote. We have read the anecdote. So, let's continue. So these were a group of school children uh, who met Conrad, who wrote to Conrad saying that they had immensely enjoyed his great magnum of his, uh, uh, the things for apart and about a, another colleague in an elite Western university who was surprised when uh, Achebe told him that he was teaching African literature. So if there is something in these utterances more than youthful inexperience, more than a lack of factual knowledge, what is it? Quite simply, it is a desire in Western psychology to set up Africa as a foil to Europe, like I told you, like Mohanlal and Mamuti, but they are like equal people. But here, Africa is the downtrodden and Europe is the emancipated. That kind of foil. Foil means that two people are fighting using fencing swords. One person is the foil of the other. Okay, this need is not new. All people have this need. So Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which better than any other work that I know, is Chinua Ch 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 displays that Western desire and need to create a diametrical opposite. There are entire libraries as large as football grounds which are devoted to the same purpose of proving European superiority by hook or crook. Conrad, on the other hand, is undoubtedly one of the great stylists of modern fiction. He is not any other ordinary run of the mill writer. He is the greatest European writer, so to speak. Heart of Darkness is indeed so secure to me that a leading Conrad scholar has numbered it among the half dozen great short novels in the English language. Heart of Darkness projects the image of Africa as the other world, the antithesis of Europe and therefore of civilization, a place where man's wanted intelligence and refinement are finally moved by triumphant bestiality. The book opens on the river themes, tranquil, resting peacefully at the decline of day after ages of good service done on the race that people expands. It's about white race. So there is a difference between uh, Thames and Congo. Like we have the Nila or Bharata Puya and the Piriya. You know? The two rivers are contrasted sometimes. Uh, likewise here the river Thames that's in the heartland of England, that's London, is contrasted against the river Congo that flows through Africa. So one is the foil of the other. Is Conrad saying that these two rivers are very different? One good, the other bad? Yes, but that's not the real point. Let that not blind us to the fact. It is not the differentness that worries Conrad, but the dirty wind of kinship, of common ancestry. So Conrad is worried that both these rivers might have a common ancestor, like Adam of Africans in Europe, or the ocean which is the common ancestor for things and the Congo, which is something that is totally unacceptable for a writer like Joseph Conrad. He himself was Polish, not English. But Chinua Achebe is too much of a gentleman to mention that. He never personally attacks Joseph Conrad by citing that you who try to be more English than the English themselves is actually not an Englishman. Your first language is Polish. You in fact have learned the English language and written in that. So you can find many mistakes and linguistic curiosities and differences in the language deployed by Joseph Conrad because he was not a native speaker of English. For the Thames too has been one of the dark places of the earth. It conquered its darkness of course and is now in daylight and at peace. But if it were to visit its primordial relative the Congo, it would run the terrible risk of hearing grotesque echoes of its own forgotten darkness and falling victim to an avenging recrudescence of the mindless frenzy of the first beginnings. Avenging recrudescence means a revenging, recapitulation, revival, retelling. These suggestive echoes comprise Joseph Conrad's famed evocation of African atmosphere in Heart of Darkness. 
is by no measure is considered sympathetic in his heart towards Africa. In the final consideration, his method amounts to no more than a steady, ponderous, fake, ritualistic repetition of two antithetical sentences, one about silence and the other about frenzy. One is the European silence and the other is African frenzy, anarchy. So here actually gives you a definition uh, from different editions. A, it was the stillness of an implacable force brooding over an inscrutable intention. And the second one, the steamer toiled along slowly on the edge of a blank and incomprehensible frenzy. These are mentions of the words frenzy and stillness in Heart of Darkness. Of course, there is a judicious change of adjective from time to time so that instead of inscrutable, for example, you might have unspeakable, even plain mysterious. So, F.R. Lewis is a famous English critic who is known to everyone. So he drew attention long ago to Conrad's adjectival insistence upon inexpressible and incomprehensible mystery. That insistence must not be dismissed lightly, as many Conrad critics have tended to do as a mere stylistic flaw, for it raises serious questions of artistic good faith. When a writer, while pretending to record scenes, incidents, and their impact, is in reality engaged in inducing hypnotic stupor in his readers through a bombardment of emotive words and other forms of trickery, much more has to be at stake than stylistic felicity. Generally, normal readers are well armed to detect and resist such underhand activity, but Conrad chose his subject well, one which is guaranteed not to put him in conflict with the psychological predisposition of his readers or raise the need for him to contend with the resistance. He chose the role of provider of comforting myths. Recording, man. Sorry. Recording, recording. Uh, so, it's alright. So, uh, instead of trying to enlighten his European counterparts, countrymen, about the greatness of Africa or the differences in Africa, Joseph Conrad rather chose to play it safe by peddling already accepted myths and stories about Africa, that it was a dark continent. He did not bother to try to change European perceptions and ideas about Africa, that it was a dark continent. The most interesting and remaining passages in Heart of Darkness are, however, about people. I must crave the indulgence of my reader, of Achebe's reader, to quote almost a whole page. We are going to read from Heart of Darkness. We were wanderers on a prehistoric earth, on an earth that bore the aspect of an unknown planet. We could have fancied ours was the first of men taking possession. So he is citing an entire passage from the Heart of Darkness for your benefit. Herein lies the meaning of Heart of Darkness and the fascination it holds over the Western mind. What thrilled you was just the thought of their humanity like yours, ugly. So he cannot stomach, he cannot digest the fact that Africans are also humans like the Europeans. Having shown us Africa in the past, Conrad then zeroes in half a page later on a specific example giving us one of his rare descriptions of an African who is not just limbs or rolling eyes. So this is what I told you. So there is on the one hand the good African and there is a bad African. Now Conrad gives you an example for the good African. As everybody knows, Conrad is a romantic on the side. He might not exactly admire savages clapping their hands and stamping their feet, but they have at least the merit of being in their place unlike this dog in a parody of preachers. So there's a dog which pretends to be a human, but these people are not like that. The good African, he knows his place. He doesn't pretend to be a white man. Fine fellows, cannibals in their place. He tells us pointedly, Tragedy begins when things leave their accustomed place, like Europe leaving its same stronghold between the policeman and the baker to take a peep into the heart of darkness. Before the story takes us into proper things and proper, we are given this nice little vignette as an example of things in their place. So, vignette is a small oval shaped photograph that sometimes decorates studio walls. You might have seen vignettes on the walls of studios. Towards the end of the story, Conrad lavishes a whole page quite unexpectedly on an African lady who is a mistress to Mr. Curls. She's like an Amazon. She's like a warrior woman. She's drawn in considerable details, but of a predictable 
nature. First, she is in her place, so can win Conrad's brand of approval. And second, she fulfills a structural requirement of the story, a savage counterpart to the refined European woman who will step forth to end the story. Like I have told you, at the end of the story, a person makes an entrance. Who is that person? That person is the fiancé, the would-be of Mr. Kurtz. And that is the beautiful white western woman who is contrasted against Mr. Kurtz's African wife, this Amazon lady. The difference in the attitude of the novelist to these two women is conveyed in too many direct and subtle ways to need elaboration. But perhaps the most significant difference is the one implied in the author's best novel of human expression to the one and withholding it from the other. Okay. This is a very important point that Conrad, sorry, Achebe is making in a very simple manner here. Because uh, Europeans could colonize locations in Asia and Africa because people were not treated as humans. It is clearly not part of Conrad's purpose to confer language on the rudimentary souls. In place of speech, they made a violent babble of uncouth sounds. They exchanged short grunting phrases even amongst themselves. But most of the time they were too busy with the frenzy. So as I have told you before, according to Joseph Conrad, silence belongs to Europe and frenzy belongs to Africa. African frenzy is contrasted against systematic European thought and reason and rational activity. So there is a difference that is posited by Joseph Conrad between frenzy and silence, between the Amazon African woman and Mrs. Kurz. And there is a difference between River Thames and River Congo. And there is a difference between uh, the European human and the African human. And there is a difference between the good African and the bad African. Okay? So he is creating a set of binaries. And as a result of these binaries, he is able to construct a kind of image of Africa as a very backward place. He doesn't contest any of the available ideas about Africa. Okay, this is a very important point that he is making. The other occasion, Mr. Kurtz, is that they don't speak. Okay, they don't speak. At first sight, his instances might be mistaken for unexpected acts of generosity from the conflict. In reality, they constitute some of his best assaults. The cannibals who grunt and also consistency in the portrayal of the bruise. That's also very clear. It's unambiguous evidence issuing out of their own mouths. They are cannibals. Okay, one of the major accusations leveled by Europeans against African civilization, which was not leveled against Indian or Chinese or Middle Eastern civilizations, was that Africans had practiced cannibalism. You might have heard stories about the Tanzanian idiom that he was eating humans in his refrigerator, there was skulls and bones, he was eating people. Okay, so these are the kind of stereotypes that were peddled by uh, Europeans in Africa. Okay. Uh, so, the announcement of Mr. Kurtz's death by the insolent blackhead in the doorway. See how Conrad is describing a black person, insolent black head in the doorway. He's not a human, he's a head. Okay. So, the point is that what better or more appropriate finish it could be written to the horror story of a favored child of civilization who willfully had given his soul to the powers of darkness and taken a high seat amongst the devils of the land than the proclamation of his physical death by the forces he had joined. So this is the defeat of European civilization by the darkness of Africa. So it is not Conrad's attitude, but this is that of the fictional narrator, Marlowe, and that far from endorsing it, Conrad might indeed be holding it up to irony and criticism. So, if in a film, you have a particular person A belonging to a particular religion and another person B belonging to another religion and A is good and B is bad, it doesn't mean the filmmaker doesn't like religion A or likes religion B. The fact is, it's a film. Okay? It's not about a representation. That is another argument you can raise in defense of Mr. Joseph Conrad. You should not look at it in an identitarian way. It is not about identity. Certainly, Conrad appears to go to considerable pains to set up layers of insulation 
between himself and the moral universe of his story. Like if you are using a thermos flask, that flask would possess a kind of insulation layer to protect the heat. Similarly, Conrad has also developed a kind of insulation layer between himself and the people he is describing and the story. This is not Conrad speaking, this is the narrator speaking. Okay, So all the faults and sins belong to the narrator, not Conrad himself. But if Conrad's intention is to draw a cordon sanitaire between himself and the moral and psychological malice of his narrator, his care seems to me totally wasted because he neglects to hint clearly and adequately at an alternative frame of reference by which we may judge the actions and opinions of his characters. It would not have been beyond Conrad's power to make that provision if he had thought it necessary. He neglects to hint at an alternative frame of reference by which we may judge the actions and opinions of his characters okay so yes he could have done that he approves Marlowe because Marlowe has no boy Marlowe is the only voice in this novel he has no antagonist he has no rival in this particular novel that means the point of view of Marlowe is Conrad's point of view in this novel because it is not opposed by any other point of view. There is nobody who is pitted against Marlowe. Marlowe is the God's voice in the novel. So you cannot claim that Conrad might be excused because of the fact that it is not Conrad who is speaking but Marlowe who is speaking. But if it was Marlowe who was speaking, why did not Conrad include another character who is arguing with Marlowe about his wrong perception. Suppose in a Shakespeare play, you have one character who is a male chauvinist, you certainly would have another female character like Portia who is arguing against that person, even though it's a very modern play and it's not a novel, but Joseph Conrad who is a modern writer and who writes in a very sophisticated manner, he doesn't have two characters like Shakespeare arguing with each other. You just have one single point of view, that of Marlowe. Marlowe comes through to us not only as a witness of truth, but one holding those advanced and humane views appropriate to the English liberal tradition, which required all Englishmen of decency to be deeply shocked by atrocities in Bulgaria or the Congo of King Leopold of the Belgians. Because Marlowe is able to toss out such bleeding heart sentiments as these. They were all dying slowly, it was very clear. They were not enemies, they were not criminals, they were nothing earthly now. The point is that everyone in Europe were condemning the atrocities that were perpetrated by the Belgians in Congo, that they were fed up with the kind of victimization of Africans. So here, Joseph Conrad is trying to get rid of that kind of victimhood and he is writing in a non-nonsensical manner. At the same time, he is also a, a romantic that is in conflict at the heart of Mr. Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, okay? Yeah. The kind of liberalism as posed here by Marlowe, that is Conrad, Conrad is Marlowe, touched all the best minds of his age in Europe, America and Africa. America, England and Europe, not Africa. It took different forms in the minds of different people but almost always managed to sidestep the ultimate question of equality between white people and black people, which was the elephant in the room. There is a big question staring you in the eyes. What is that question? Are black people equal to white people? But that particular question, it's a very relevant question, which is the most relevant question, is not tackled by Mr. Joseph Conrad. Okay? So there is another great American novel called Uncle Tom's Cabin by a great writer, Harriet B. Justoff. Abraham Lincoln, in fact, said it was the book that gave rise to the American Civil War and the liberation of the Afro-Americans in America. The point here is that the particular novel is often condemned as being very emotional and extremely melodramatic. It is not a classic of world literature. You are not studying that in your first year or second year or third year. But on the other hand, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is in every MA syllabus all over the world. The point is, it's a sophisticated, deeply erudite and learned novel. But at the same time, 
this novel does not raise the particular question of equality okay it might be a good novel but what about its politics so you might say aesthetics is a kind of politics but that's a very controversial argument so there is a missionary person his name is albert schweitzer he sacrificed a billion, ca billion career in music and theology in Europe for a life of service to Africans in much the same area as Conrad writes about. He epitomized the ambivalence. Albert Schweitzer said, The African is my brother, but my junior brother. It's a very controversial statement by the missionary. Uh, so, uh, Chino actually also has a kind of born to blind against uh, missionaries that you might have learned from his great work things for a part so albert schweitzer said african is my brother but junior brother is patronizing in his tone so he proceeded to build a hospital appropriate to the needs of junior brothers not co-brothers no? not brothers of the same age or elder brothers but for people who have to be patronized and taken care of who are like children who are infant time who should be led by the hand as a parent does naturally he became a sensation in europe and america pilgrims flocked to schweizer Conrad's liberalism would not take him quite as far as schweizer's he would not use the word brother but he uses kinship there is some kind of kinship Okay, there is a distant kinship. There is a distant kinship. It is important to note that Conrad, uh, careful as ever with his words, is concerned not so much about distant kinship as about someone laying claim on it. It's a claim. Okay, it's a claim on uh, this particular distant kinship. Okay. The point of my observation could be clear by now. That Joseph Conrad was a thoroughgoing racist. He is very unequivocal. He is very unequivocal. He is not saying in certain registers Mr. Conrad appears to be racist. No, he is very unequivocal. He says Mr. Joseph Conrad was a thoroughgoing racist. This simple truth is glossed over in criticisms of his work due to the fact that white racism is normal, normativized. It is normativized. Okay. Because nobody even thought of that till Mr. Chinua Achube came along. Nobody even mentioned this fact. So, heart of darkness is not about Africa, but about the deterioration of one European. It's not an African novel, it's about Europe. It's about Europe. Conrad is, if anything, less charitable to the Europeans in the story than he is to the natives. He is ridiculing Europeans. In Scotland, Africa is merely a setting for the disintegration of the mind of Mr. Goods. Which is partly the point. Africa as setting the backdrop which eliminates the African as a human factor. Africa is a metaphysical battlefield devoid of all recognizable humanity into which the wandering European enters at his peril. Can nobody see the preposterous and perverse arrogance in this reducing Africa to the role of props for the breakup of one petty European mind? But that is not even the point. The real question is the dehumanization of Africa and Africans, which this age long attitude has fostered and continues to foster in the world. And the question is whether a novel which celebrates this dehumanization depersonalizes a major portion of the human race. And it is called a great work of art. It cannot. I do doubt. I do not doubt Conrad's talent. It's a good novel in parts. Its exploration of the minds of the European characters is often penetrating and full of insight. But his racism was not addressed. So Conrad was born in 1857, the very year in which the first Anglican missionaries were arriving among his people, Achebe's people. It was certainly not his fault that he lived at a time when the reputation of the black man was at a particularly low level. But even after due allowances were made for the influences of contemporary prejudice on his particular kind of sensibility, there still remains in Conrad's attitude a residue of antipathy to black people with his particular psychology alone can explain. His own 
account of his first encounter with the black man is very revealing. So, Conrad's attitude towards black people is not just because of the period that he was living in, because of the context he was born in, or because he was living during a time at which racism was rampant and very common among Europeans. But there are also certain aspects of heart of darkness which point towards the fact that Conrad personally, psychologically, was also a racist. A certain enormous buck nigger encountered in Haiti fixed my conception of blind, furious, unreasoning rage as manifested in the human animal to the end of my days of the nigger I used to drink for years afterwards. So even in his dreams, in his dreams, okay, in that sleep of reason, what dreams may come, according to Shakespeare. So in his dreams also he is frightened by African people. So his dreams become nightmares. Certainly Conrad had a problem with niggers. It's a bad word. His inordinate love of that word itself should be of interest to psychoanalysts. Sometimes his fixation on blackness is equally interesting as when he gives us this brief description. A black figure stood up, stored on long black legs, waving long black arms. So it's as if he's frightened with blackness. Even when he is sleeping, he is frightened of black people. As a matter of interest, Conrad gives us in a personal record what amounts to a companion piece to the buck nigger of Haiti. So this is a particular work by Conrad, which is a personal record. A personal record in that he says, my unforgettable Englishman and describes him in the following manner. His calves exposed to public gaze dazzled the beholder by the splendor of their marble like condition in a very positive fashion. Irrational love and irrational hate jostling together in the heart of that talented, tormented man. So there is irrational, unreasonable love for the Englishman and unreasonable hatred for the African in Joseph Conrad. He is a dream for psychoanalytic critics. Okay. So there is a writer called Bernard Mayer, Bernard Mayer, who has undertaken this particular task. Mayer follows every conceivable lead to explain Mr. Joseph Conrad. As an example, Mayer gives long explanations on the significance of hair and hair cutting in Conrad, but not a word on black people. Not even the discussion of Conrad's anti-Semitism was enough to spark off in Dr. Mayer's mind those dark and explosive thoughts which only leads one to surmise that psychoanalysts must regard the kind of racism described by Conrad by Fanon in the psychiatric hospitals of French Algeria. So Fanon was a major post-colonial writer who worked on uh, mental patients in uh, French territories. So he was a great psychoanalyst, but that kind of insight was not brought by critics of Joseph Conrad, like Mayer. Whatever Conrad's problems were, you might say he is now safely dead. Quite true. Unfortunately, his heart of darkness plagues us still, which is why an offensive and deplorable book can be described by a serious scholar as among the half dozen great short novels in the English language. So you are third year students, you might be familiar with the phrase, the author is dead. Who is born, the work is born, and the reader is born. Even though Joseph Conrad is dead and gone, and his ashes have been buried, the fact remains that his book is hugely popular and it still attracts millions of readers all over the world and is taught to students. There are two pos pro possible grounds for this. The first is that it is no concern of fiction to place people about whom it is written. So, fiction is not about representing reality. It is not a Satyanatika dream, okay? It's not about realism. It could be about fantasy, okay? So why cannot you read Joseph Conrad's work as some kind of a fantastical work on unreal things and not real things? But he is talking about a book which parades in the most vulgar fashion prejudices and insults from which a section of mankind has suffered and many places today, okay? Thank you so much for joining us. Yes.